So, my name is Sandy Metz. I wrote code for 35 years. Every day I went to my desk and wrote code. I'm a woman of a certain age. <laughs> and then I wrote a book, and that was kind of by accident. I won't tell you all about that, but it was, the, writing a book was like, uh, it was like having a bomb go off in my life. It changed everything. Right? I started getting invitations to conferences. I ended up having to quit my day job because I worked for a university, and they, wouldn't, they weren't willing for me to have that much time off. And so it uh, became incumbent upon me to find a way to make a living. And I started teaching. People were asking me to teach. And so for the last couple of years, I've been doing a lot of teaching of uh, object-oriented design. And uh, curriculum is really hard. I made up some curriculum. Actually, I feel quite bad for the first students of my course. Katrina Owen, who's here, helped me make up curriculum, teach the first course. We had a five-day course that we now teach in three days and have more content. <laughs> it sucked as a teacher. What can you do, right? We did the best we can in it. And back, back in the day, two years ago, when I started making up curriculum for that course, I thought I was making a bunch of different exercises. I thought I was teaching people a bunch of important but unrelated things. And now, my day job basically is to think about how to write code and think about how to explain how to write code. And in the, in the leisure that I've had over the last couple of years, I've come to realize that Everything I've been telling people has a single underlying principle. That it's not a bunch of different things, it's really one thing. And I didn't understand it, I couldn't see it to begin with. And so this talk is the, a 30 minute, 30-ish minute distillation of two years of teaching experience. And it's got a lot of code in it, so move forward, okay? So, so here we go. I, um, it became clear to me after I wrote that book that I had an idea. The way I thought about objects was different than the way a lot of my fellow Rubyists thought about objects. And that is because uh, I've been writing Ruby for 10 years now. I have not yet written Ruby for as many years as I wrote Smalltalk. I learned OO from Smalltalk. And so I am uh, infected by small talk. Now, so this talk's gonna be in four parts. They build on one another, so I'm gonna start at the bottom. I say small talk infected, but really I mean inoculated. I'm inoculated against certain things because of my experience with small talk. And in the first part of this talk, I wanna give you just one small sense of what small talk would have done to you had you written it for a long time, all right? And here's an example. You know what that is. It's this. Now, you may or may not be familiar with the send message. So you can send a symbol, which will uh, kind of awkwardly, like I can invoke the 2S message by sending it. There's a, there's a send message that sends messages. All right? And so that does the same thing. Now, in Ruby, we also have this. That might look special, but it's there just to make you feel OK. All right? <laughs> That is really this, and you get the same result. Now, that's a fixed num, and it knows things. It knows a bunch of stuff. Among them, it knows that. That's a method on fixed num. That's what plus is. It's not special syntax in the language. The special syntax is the syntax that lets you say one plus one, right? This is what's at the bottom of all things. This, we're sending a message. <clears throat> and you notice that we also have that. So you can do this, and I don't have to convince you now that I'm sending equal equal to a fixed num and passing an argument. Well, I get that back, one equal equal one, I get that thing back, and that's an object. It's an instance of true class. True is a constant, it's a, if you think of it as a variable that holds the singleton instance of true class. When Ruby boots up, it goes to true class and says new to it, and it takes the result and it puts it in that variable. And that way you have it, it's defined for your use the whole time Ruby is up. And so true class knows things. Now, this is a useful lie. It's really, this is really not everything, but let's pretend for right now that this is what true class knows. And so I am very comfortable with this, right? Sure, true is an object, it's an instance of true class, just like false is an instance of false class, and nil is an instance of nil class. This was not confusing to me when I came to Ruby. What was confusing to me when I came to Ruby is that Ruby had a special syntax for dealing with Booleans. I found that very confusing, a special syntax. In Smalltalk, 
These are the keywords in Smalltalk. This is the entire set of Smalltalk keywords. In contrast, here's the Ruby list. And if you look on the Ruby list, you'll notice there's this. There's a special keyword that you use this way, right? You say, if one equal equal one, then I'm going to do what's in the true branch. Otherwise, I'm going to do what's in the false branch. And that about that, this case evaluates to true. <clears throat> And so this was very peculiar to me. This seemed very odd, right? This is very procedural. Like the scripting languages that we came out of that had long procedures, we used to write these long nested conditions, right? Condition after condition after condition. But not only do we have this in Ruby, we got, it's worse, right? Because we got this whole idea of truthy. There's truthiness. If it's truthy, then I'll do what's in the true branch. Otherwise, I'll do what's in the false branch. And, and really, this is, this is a type check. If I know the kind of object you are, I'll do one thing, otherwise I'll do another. And that is anathema to me. That is absolute anathema. I do not want to do type checks on objects. I just want to send a message. I want to send a message to an object. And so to illustrate how easy this is in an object-oriented language to get rid of that syntax, that special syntax that deals with conditionals, let's just write some code, OK? Let's write message, let's write small talk like message sending syntax in Ruby. <clears throat> First, we are going to have to break open true class. Why not? You're going to love it. Right? And I'm going to put an if true message on it. And in it, I'm going to just say yield. Right? So every method takes a block, the implicit block. I'm going to yield to the implicit block and return self. Don't worry about the self for a minute. It doesn't matter for right now. Right? So in the if true uh, method, I'm going to yield to the block if one got passed. And then false will do nothing. In the false class, I'll do just the opposite. So in the true yields during if true and false yields during if false. And so if you write this code, if you break open those classes and monkey patch them in this way, what you can do then is this. You can say, if you send if true to a true, remember that that's going to yield to the block, which means if you run it, if you run that code after making that monkey patch, you'll get this result. And remember that false does not yield to the block. And so if you send if false to true, you'll get nothing back. Right? Now, so you can, you can imagine already, think ahead to how it works when it's flipped around. So if I have false, false does just the opposite, right? If I send if true to a false, it's going to do nothing. It is not going to evaluate that block. And if I ask false if it's if I ask a false if it is false, it will yield to the block. It's as simple as that. And so now this code works, but it doesn't really solve the whole problem because I just have true and false here. I don't have truthy. It's really easy to make truthy work. I'll just promote this to, up to object. Because <laughs> why not? <laughs> and I'll copy that in a nil class. I'll duplicate that code in a nil class. All right, and now everything is truthy except false or nil, which is exactly how Ruby works. I, this is, I took this code right from Yehuda Katz's example from this blog post, proving that nothing is new. And so now I, I don't need a true there. I can put anything there. Everything is true, and it's not false, except for nil, which just like false, is false. And so now instead of writing this code, instead of using that special syntax to deal with conditionals, <clears throat> I can do this. Or if it went to false, I can do that. And it totally works. You do not have to have any special code. I can send messages to objects to manage control flow. Now, having done this, I am not suggesting that we do it. <laughs> right? I'm not suggesting that we do it, but I want, you, I want you to think about what your ideas about objects would be like if you didn't have an if statement. Right? You came to Ruby, most of you, many of you came to Ruby from other languages that were more procedural, and your procedural mindset was allowed to plug right into Ruby because the if statement was there. Had, when you came to Ruby, had there not been any syntax to do conditionals, it might have changed how you think about object-oriented code. And I want you to imagine you live in that world, because that's the world I live in, and it shaped all my thoughts about OO. 
So I'm infected by small talk. And because of that, you can guess I'm extremely condition averse. Extremely condition averse. And here's a condition. Here's a condition that I hate that's really common in Ruby, right? Let's imagine there's an animal. This, you can look out, you can pass a key to it like pig and you'll get an animal back. If you pass, a, if you pass an ID or a key that's not there, you get back nil. This might remind you of something in Rails. Don't quote me. Ah, what just happened? That's just here, wait, I can fix that. You know, the, oh, somebody, I'm supposed to be on a phone call with somebody. That's what my, <laughs> that's what my calendar just told me. You know, this might take a minute, because here, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, look, it's going to be fun. There we go. See, look how easy that was. They used to terrify me. You know, you get, it just, things just get easier. I'm, I've made, I make mistakes for a living so much that it's like it doesn't even phase me anymore. <laughs> this, OK, so if you, if you pass a key that's there, you get an animal back. If you pass a key that's not there, you get no back. And so let's say that you innocently, someone passes you an array of keys, and you innocently call find on animal for all those keys. If you do, in this case, what you'll get back is that array. And then, if you want to talk to them all and ask them their names, well, the first one tells you it's a pig, and then kaboom. Right? And so we, so this is, so first of all, I, I'm going to put one caveat right here, right? Sometimes nil means nothing. It really does. Sometimes nil means nothing. And if it does, you should just compact that array. Right, throw the nil away. We don't have, we can't return void in Ruby, and something always comes back. And if you get a nil and you don't care, you should just throw it away. In this case, I just have pigs and sheep. But now, but if you're sending a message to those objects that come back, there's something. That nil means something, and you need to deal with it in a different way. And so in this case, what we often do here is we put, we just put a conditional right there. Right? And here's when I wrote it all out then in the ternary form. Right? If it's no, I'm going to say, say no animal. This is like there's no user logged on, and you're going to say guest. And you have that code in your views. Right? If user, you know, user bar bar, username or guest, you put this code right there. Now, this works, and I can, say, I can get no animal back in every case here. But this is ugly, and we just can't bear that ugly code. So we start improving this code. We start hiding the conditional. And one way we can hide it is we can use truthiness. So that looks better. That makes me feel better because it looks better, right? Now, this relies on the fact that nil, if you interpolate nil into a string, you get an empty string back. So all of a sudden, I can't say no animal anymore. I can't call that user a guest. So I'm just going to get nothing back here. So now I got pigs in an empty string and sheep. And then, but even that's too ugly. So if you're a Rails programmer, you're going to say try. <laughs> right? Try that. And I'm not saying you should never use try, but I'm saying that I still got the empty string. This is really that. Let's be honest about what's going on here, right? This is that. And that, like, it's this, this nil question mark method is very interesting, right? Nil answers nil question mark and says true. Object answers nil question mark and says false. But hash doesn't have one. There's no hash question mark method. There's no string question mark method, right? This is, this is an implicit acknowledgment that we nil sometimes means nothing. But, but this one here, wait, I have a pointer. Wait, I love doing this. Look, I have a pointer and you don't. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Saying that is just saying this. This is an equality test. And since there's only, it's a singleton, there's one instance of we're doing this. This is a check on class. This is a check on type for nil. And if you're doing this, it's really that, if you wrote it all out. And if you write it that down, then I really want no animal there. I want to make it harder, right? That empty string does not help. Mostly I want to say something there. And this looks like that, which is what I told you in part one I hated. Right? Only it's worse here. It's worse here than it was in part one, because really I'm saying, if this is an object whose type I know, I'll supply some behavior. Otherwise, I'll send a message. That's what we're saying. If I know the type of this object, I will supply the behavior. Otherwise, I'll send a message. And the problem with that is it's a condition, and conditions breed. If you have one, you will get more. It always happens. <laughs> And so here, what, the problem here is this no animal thing. Like, this code gets all over, right? It isn't, <laughs> it isn't long before there are hundreds of places in your app that have to supply the missing behavior. And, now, and if you want to change that anywhere, then you have a, the code smell for the change you have to make at that point is called shotgun surgery. And there's a reason why, right? It's everywhere. That change is propagated in many places. So this is a bad idea. I hate these kinds of conditions. I am very, very condition averse. 
Instead, what I am is message-centric. I just want to send a message to an object. I do not want to know this stuff. I just want to send a message somewhere. What I want to do is that. I want to do that and nothing else. Now, the problem here is that when I make the call to find on animal, I get back objects that do not conform to the same API. I'm going to say that again, right? I call, I send a call, I, I, I send a message to some other object, and it passes me back things that answer to different APIs. The animals I get back do not conform to the same API that nil does. Nil doesn't understand name. And what I really want, I'm going to do, Ben, I think Ben mentioned this, right? I write a lot of code uh, based on, I write the code I wish I had. The code we wish we had is we wish there was somewhere that we could send the name message and get back the string no animal. Let's just make that object. Why not? We can do that. And I would rather know about this object than know about that behavior. Always. All right? And so here, if I had that missing animal class, here's how I could use it, right? I could say bar bar right there and replace the nils with that missing animal. If I did that in this case, I would get an animal there. I get there's someone that conforms to the same API as in every place in this array. Now you notice that nothing is free. I've added a new dependency. And I still have a conditional. The, the conditional's not even gone. But what has happened is the behavior's moved. The behavior's moved. And that is better. Now, all of a sudden, I can do this. And I can do that. And then, thankfully, I can do this. All right? And so, and I get the results I want. And so now my problem is a little bit better. My code is a little bit better. What I have, instead of, having, instead of knowing no animal, in a million places. Oh, sorry. I, I get that wrong every time I practice. Pretend I didn't say that. OK, here, let's back up. So missing animal, what is this? This has a name. <laughs> Can you get? <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Yeah, look, it has a name. It's this. It's the null object pattern. And I know that there's, there are ways in, in the Ruby community, like I am, I am self-taught, right? I am a. I have a psychology degree. I wrote code. I figured stuff out the hard way for many years. And, and you know, I made a lot of mistakes. I figured out the null object pattern all by myself. And I happened to be working with someone who was better uh, read than me, who came back the next day and said, that thing has a name. Right? I was like struggling and struggling with the problem. And I, and I, I had, I knew that, I kept saying, if only I had a thing that would just answer this message the right way. And I had to discover it for myself. And I tell you, it's the wrong way to do things. Like, people have figured a lot of these things out. And if you can just find a way to, to become a little bit more aware of the literature, lots and lots of things get easier. And so the null object pattern, someone described it as the active nothing. I want to plug in an object, right? I want to plug in an active nothing. OK, so now back to the place I tried to go a minute ago. So I got this new dependency. And so I'm duplicating that, the name of that class everywhere instead of that string, instead of the no animal string. And so I told you that I would prefer to know that object than to duplicate the behavior. But the truth is, I really also want to know only a few objects. And right now, what has happened is, every place I call animal.find, I, now I have this dependency, right? It goes on and on and on. But this, and once you get here, this is really easy to fix. I mean, here's the class. Let, let's assume this, is some, this, this belongs to some external framework, right? I cannot change this code. And it is untrustworthy. I can't change the code, and they're gonna, when I make calls, they're going to return things that conform to different APIs. It's easy enough. I'm just going to put that in a box and wrap it in another box. I'll wrap it in my own code. And in my own code, I'll do that conditional. One place in my whole app. And then I'll make all of my code not do that, but do this. Right? So I'm going to wrap it. I'm going to put a wrapping class around the offending API and fix it. And then I'm going to require that all the places in my code call my new thing. And so now I get that. And I get that. It just works. It's incredibly easy. It's a really simple idea. It took me a long time to think of it. And you should not have to think of it yourself. All right. So I push the creation of this new object to the edge, to the boundaries of my system as much as I can. And this absolutely decreases the complexity of my application. And it comes from being message-centric. It comes from insisting that I want to send a message. But now comes the big idea. 
So the null object pattern is, think of it this way, it's a concrete instance of a much bigger idea. And it was really interesting to me. I, I had seen Tom's talk before, the talk that Tom just gave about abstractions. Uh, I saw it in the fall, and I didn't really understand it. I don't know. He may have influenced my thinking about this some. I don't know. I was unaware of it, but I, uh, when I, I was struck by watching his talk, by how well it dovetailed into what I'm about to say to you. So if you think of the null object pattern, is, it says, sometimes nil is a thing, and you should put an object in there to supply the behavior that you wish nil had, right? If you think of the forest and the trees, the nil object pattern is like a shrub, and there's a 10,000 foot idea way up above it. And if you could understand this bigger abstraction, it would make all your code easier, all right? And so this last part of the talk is about that higher level abstraction. Here we go. In order to do it, I'm gonna have to introduce a new example. This is the tail, the house that Jack built. Uh, I hope that you know it. Do you know it generally? You're, oh, you, okay. So it's a cumulative tale. So it goes like this. So it's a, it's a thing that kids learn when they're children, right? So the first line is, this is the house that Jack built. And then it accumulates, new bits get, uh, get shoved in in front of the bits that are there. This is the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. And then the next line would be, this is the rat that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. And there's 12 different bits that get plugged in, and here's the whole thing. This would be the 12th line. And so if you're going to recite the whole tale, you'd recite line one, and then line two, and then line three, and each one would get a little longer. Tales are really interesting. If you go look this up on Wikipedia, it's two hops to Guy Steele and Java. Right? They're very algorithmic, these songs. I, in that class I teach we, teach, we use a lot of tales and songs to teach because the, these kinds, they're iterative, often, and cumulative, and they help uh, let you learn how to deal with algorithms in domains that you're already familiar with. And so if you were going to write the song, if you were going to write the Ruby code to produce that tale, you would likely do something like this. You'd, you'd get all the bits and you'd put them in an array, maybe you'd wrap a method around it, and then you'd have, perhaps implement a phrase method that will go in and get, you may not know the last method on array, like you can ask an array for its last thing, and it'll give you the last item, but you can also pass an argument, you can pass three and you'll get the last three things in the array. So as you're looping through a line at a time, the number of the line you're on represents how many bits that you want out of that array, how many bits should be in that line. Um, I'm gonna make that smaller because you know it's in there, you don't need to see it anymore, and I need the space. So the, I have a line method that puts the this is and the period on the end of it, so that's how you make a whole line, right? And then line calls phrase on whatever line number I'm in to get the middle part that accumulates. And then the recite, which does all 12 lines of the song, is just gonna loop over the number of bits in the array uh, yielding a number to the block and then calling line on that block. So that's how the whole thing goes. And then if you wrap it in a class, you got it. This will produce the, uh, produce the whole tale. And so if I were to call, get a new house and call line one, I would see that. Line two gives me that. Line three gives me that. Line 12 gives me that. And then recite does something like this. Okay, so that's, that's the house that Jack built. So imagine that you've written the house that Jack built. You have a customer that asked for it. And then once you have it done, they come and ask you for a new feature. They want random house. All right, here's how random house works. They want you to take the array and they want you to randomize it. All right, now every time you randomize it, of course, you get a different output. But for our example here, this is one random, in this case, it ends in the rat that ate, the main alpha run the milk, the cat that killed. And so random house for this randomization ought to be line one is this is the rat that ate, the main alpha run the milk, the rat that ate. The cat that killed the maiden off for learning that milk the rat that ate. Okay, so it's now time for me to warn you. Here's what the thing looks like. It is true that despite its innocent nature, many variants of randomization are not safe for work. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, in this case, <laughs> that the good news is that the good news is that it's an equal opportunity offender. Pretend, pretend you're watching South Park. Do you know South Park? Yeah, okay, South Park from here on out. Okay, so if I wanted to, so here's the code we have. You have to keep house, you cannot break house. Right, house is, I, I like house, I wanna keep house. I also want random house, and I'm gonna give you, a, I'm gonna charge you to implement random house without adding any of statements. You cannot have conditionals. 
So there's a really simple solution. If you use conditionals right, you can just plug a Boolean in that says whether it's random or not, and then randomize the array, right? That's not what we're going to do here. So I, I really want two things from you. I want you to implement Random House without using any if statements, and I want you not to alter the code you have in order to do it. That's O principle and solid, right? I, you're allowed to rearrange this code if you want, but at the point when you try to implement Random House, I do not want you to change the code you have. Now, this, the solution to this may not be immediately obvious, but there is a thing that we commonly do in this case. We say, well, I can meet both those criteria with inheritance. I can, do, I can produce Random House without any conditionals and without changing the code I have. So let's just do that. Here's the thing. I can subclass house. I can override data. I can call shuffle. Shuffle's the method on array that randomizes the contents. Now, since I only want to shuffle it at the beginning of the song and produce this, the lines out of the same shuffled array over again, I have to, in this case, I have to cache the result. So if I write this code and I get a new instance of Random House, sure enough, using the same randomization I got last time, this works. It is exactly right, and House still works just fine. In this case, you can see that somewhere in there, the priest is marrying the man that's kissing the horse. And so, so great, that's awesome, right? It may, and it actually may be the, co the most cost efficient way to do business right now. But so let's, 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 let's get another feature request. Another new feature request, this is what happens, right? And now they want Echo House. They like Random House, they wanna keep it. They like House, they wanna keep it. They want Echo House. And here's how Echo House goes. It echoes the bits. This is the house that Jack built, the house that Jack built. This is the multi lane, the multi lane, the house that Jack built, the house that Jack built, right? The rat that ate, the rat that ate, the multi lane. All right, and so this is the code I have, and it's this bit right here that goes in the array and gets the three parts. I need that bit to change, and it's a little awkward here because this method has a violation of single responsibility in it. It does two things. It gets things out of the array and it joins them with spaces. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just a tiny bit of refactoring. I'm gonna take that and extract it into a method of its own and then call it so that I can just mess with parts. And so this is all the code that we care about right now. Right now I get this back in house when I call it. What I need back, it would work, Echo House would work if I could only get that back instead. This is what I want. And so you have the same task. I want you to implement Echo House without adding any conditionals. And I don't want you to edit the code we have. And now that we've gone down the inheritance path, of course we're going to do it again. Absolutely. It's easy. It is so easy to solve this problem. Look, I'm going to subclass house. Um, now that I have the parts isolated, I'm going to override the parts method. I'm going to call super zip super <laughs> flatten. Let me just tell you a little bit about that. So if you have an array that looks like that, that's what you get if you called super. Zip sounds like compress, but it's not. It's zipper. All right? And so what zip does is it matches them up in order wise. So you get this back if you call super zip super, this two-dimensional array where it's doubled up on the parts, and then the flatten, of course, flattens it out so you have single things. And so this totally works. It absolutely works, right? That I can call one, I can call two, I can call three, I can do the whole thing. And so here's the code we have. That's what house has in it. I got random house that overrides data, I got echo house that overrides parts. <laughs> So now, of course, they want, yeah, they always do this, don't they? They want random echo house. And so now you're screwed, right? You are, you are well and royally screwed. And, and here's why, right? We don't even need house anymore. Here's the problem we have. So I need behavior. I have two subclasses that have behavior, and I want another subclass that has the behavior out of both of them. And there's no way now to proceed forward with inheritance without duplicating some code. And some people have, well, people occasionally insist that there is, but there ain't, really. Watch, right? So here's what you can do. These are your choices. You can duplicate some of the code. You can uh, subclass. You can make random echo house subclass random house, in which case you can inherit the data method, but you must duplicate parts. Or you can just flip-flop it and inherit off echo house, in which case you get parts for free, but you got to duplicate data. And these two choices 
are so patently wrong that when I go places and look at people who have run into this problem, very often they make neither of those choices. What they do instead <laughs> is they duplicate all the code. Because there is a way in which it feels more honest to have everything just subclass house and to copy all of the code into this new. It, it, is, it feels almost like as if it is more right than the alternative. And this sucks. This is absolutely wrong. And it's wrong because inheritance is for specialization, not for sharing code. All right, and now I'm going to tell you how to recognize this problem and how to get out of it. The first question you have to ask yourself, if it, if it is a specialization, then random house is a house. It is a kind of house. And it's really easy to think that it is a house because it says random house, <laughs> right? And so the naming, naming, right? Hardest problem in computer science, cache and validation and naming. The name tells me, the name implies to me, but really what you have to ask yourself when you look at this code is what is different? What is different here? And, and that code is so, what changed between them? And this code, it's really hard to, to glance at that code and know what's different. It's very hard to answer that question. So let me give you a thing you can do there. This is paradoxical. You can make it more obvious how things are different, the way in which things are different, by making them more alike. And so let's try that. You don't have to know the answer. I'm just going to make them more alike until I can see the way in which they're different. So I'm going to make that like this. And in order to do that, first I'm going to go to the top, and I'm just going to pull that, that data out and put it in a constant. And then I'm going to do something that might seem really pointless. I'm going to set a variable to that, and then I'm going to make a method. I'm not even going to use an adder reader yet, because I want them to look as much alike as I can make them. I'm going to do that. And now, if I take out all the code but this, it's much easier to get a sense of what changed here. Now, you have to be able to give the thing that changed a name. You've got to be able to identify and name the concept here. And that can be really, really hard in these cases. But I, actually, I, had a, I was lucky enough to teach with Abdi Grimm, whom some of you might know. And he suggested, we were trying to ask a leading question get people to discover this. And he said, imagine it's a spreadsheet. What would you label the columns? And so this, OK, class, data, I'm sorry. That's a crappy name, I know. I did that. But the, question, the real interesting question here is, what is the name of this column? And it's not randomization. Randomization is not what I'm doing. This isn't the column for random. This is a column for order. And if that's true, then this is not nothing. This is an algorithm for ordering. And it's just as valid as this other one. And so if I were to write, so now, now that I know it's order that is varying, order is clearly not a house. And that means that this is not a problem for inheritance. It's a role. And I'm just going to write some orders. Here's one. If I had a random order whose API was order and it took in an array, it could shuffle the thing it got and return it. What's the other one look like? What's it do? It just returns it. That's an algorithm. Right? It's an algorithm for ordering. And so this is the code the way we saw it last. Now, I'm going to just make an adder reader there so I can make that a little smaller. So I'm going to remove the responsibility for ordering from house, from the house I have now. I'm just, now I'm back just working on the house class. And we're, we're returning to something that Ben talked about this morning, right? We're going to uh, invert the dependencies by injecting them. I got this thing. What I can do is, is shove it in there. I can inject an orderer in there. And then I can give it a chance to operate on the data. Now house is no longer responsible for ordering. It just has an orderer that does it. <clears throat> and if I run this, this works. All right, so what have I done? I got more code to, to accomplish exactly the same behavior. <laughs> right? and, and people hate this. They look at this and they say, oh, this is object-oriented design, right? They made a bunch of objects. They, they, unduly made, they made it unduly complicated. They complicated it for no good reason. But now watch. Why don't I shove that one in, and now I got random. This is composition. I'm going to inject an object to play the role of the thing that varies. 
And now that you've seen that, Echo House is incredibly easy, right? I'm going to make an Echo formatter. And I'll just make a default formatter, right? The default formatter, the, the default format is to, is to format it in no new way. I'm going to have to take it, and I'll put a default. This, this is what lets house continue to work the way it has. I'm going to go ahead and, oh, wait, here, I did that just for Katrina. Let me back up. Notice, notice I'm adding code, and then it, it, they got to line up. <laughs> they got to line up. It's killing me. We'll put that in there. OK. And so and I'm going to go, I'm, I'm worried about it. I don't want to intervene in too big a place. So I'm going to go all the way down here at the point where the responsibility for picking the right items out of the array is still in-house. The responsibility for ordering those items goes with the formatter. Whatever I plugged in is going to get a chance right at this point to do it. So house still works. That's the same output we had before. But now, in addition to what I did before, I can inject an echo formatter, and I will get echoing. And so I got these two roles. There's, a, there's an order role and a formatter role. And now I can use them this way. Instead of pr printing a line, I'm just going to say recite the whole thong, song, since that's a little simpler. I can, inject, I can get the normal house. I can inject a random order and get the random house. I can inject an echo formatter and get the echo house, or I can inject the random order and the echo formatter and get them both. And that is no longer more code. It's actually quite a bit less code. It's, and there's not a bit of duplication in here. I've got this, these units of pluggable behavior that are defined around the roles, around the concepts. And this is composition and dependency injection. It's real, this is what it means to do object-oriented design, and it is actually totally awesome. <laughs> All right, so I'm abstraction-seeking. So here we go. These are the high-level lessons. If you're, talking to nil, if you're talking to the nils, there's something. And you should use the null object pattern. You should make objects to stand in in the place to respond to the messages that you want to send them. The active nothing. Use the active nothing. Quit putting uh, check, nil checks in your views. You're done with that as of today. No more. Right? Stop that. <laughs> Beware of inheritance. Now, inher I think inheritance is fine. I use inheritance all the time. It is not a bad thing, but it is not for sharing behavior. You, if, you, if, you wanna, if you're going to inherit off something, you should, inherit, it should be, you should specialize most of the behavior of the superclass that you're getting. And finally, and this is a big idea, there's no such thing as one specialization. If you find yourself wanting to inherit, ch to change a little bit of behavior of a big class, the new behavior that you added is one thing, but the thing it's changing in the class is another. And it's there, right? There's, all, there's never just one specialization. There's always two, by definition. If you're making one specialization, you're specializing something, and that's the other half of it. So in that case, notice that. You need to isolate the difference, name the concept, define the role, and then inject the players of those roles. And in order to do this, you have to believe in that nothing. Believe in the nothing, because nothing is always something. There you go. Thank you. Thank you.